Welcome to another episode of the Urban Wall Street Project. I'm your host, Earl Christian III, of course. And today I have an amazing show, a dynamic show, and a very serious show. Um, many of us understand that the educational system across the country and abroad doesn't always necessarily provide what students uh, need. However, I do know that there are individuals who are working in schools who are trying to give your students and your children, I should say, the best that they can. So we're going to look inside the teacher's mind or the teacher's perspective with regard to the urban public schools because this is a serious situation. Parents, step your game up because if you don't, um, their jobs will be in vain. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to some amazing women who are doing some amazing things with kids in urban public schools. Ladies, how are you this evening? Good. Great. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Right, very Thank good. You. Um, so I have Miss Aisha Edwards, Miss Carla Anderson, and Miss Ebony Parks, and they are teachers here in a public school here in the Bronx. So I want to get right into it because you know I, I met you ladies and we talk, and I have my young producers program in your school, and I actually work with you, Miss Parks, and right. that's how um, I'll be able to come to you. Um, but at the same time, I'll hear a lot of stories, sometimes war stories, um, and I hear from the kids, but you know, rarely does we ever put this together, and I haven't seen it in urban America. So for me, it was important to really just start to understand and try to see what's going on with the kids from a <laughs> teacher's perspective. I talk to the students and I get their opinion mm -hmm. and their beliefs and now I want to talk to these teachers and get their opinion. So um, I'm just going to go in. Carl, I want to ask you because yes. I know you're, you're, maybe you're the, you're the senior teacher here yes. <laughs> and you've been doing this. So let's just talk about um, your opinion. What's going on with the public schools? Um, in my opinion is that the parents at this point are almost have given up on their children. Over the last 10 years, I see a decline in parents participating, being part of the children's lives in their education in this area where we're teaching. I feel that society has been playing a negative role, even though they have discussed positive roles out there, but we are seeing actually the negativity part of the TV, the negativity part of the rap, the negativity part of the computers. We're not seeing in the positive side. And um, over the last 10 years, I've noticed the language, the foul language, the disrespect of teachers in um, the classroom, the ability to have control. Who has control? The students are at this point walking around acting as if they have control of the classroom and that the teachers cannot have control. And that's real, and I, and I, and I definitely concur, <laughs> but I did a show and it was just me because I had gotten so fed up and it was called who rules urban schools? This is called uh, Miseducation of Urban America mm -hmm. Part 2. Mm -hmm. Who rules urban schools? Because it seems like the students are in control. Yes. Um, now, Ms. Edwards, your take on it. My take? Um, I'm fairly new to teaching, but part of what I see is parents aren't as involved as I think they should be, but also there's no accountability for the student anymore. Mm -hmm. the, between the parents and the administrations in schools and just the general, the de Department of Ed, it's always, well, the teacher needs to do this and the teacher needs to do that and the teacher should do this. I've got kids who come to school expecting me to provide them with pencils. They can't even right. bring that for themselves. They're not held accountable for anything they do. If they don't succeed, it's never because they didn't bother to actually study or to do the homework or to listen in class. It's because something the teacher is doing wrong. Right, okay. And Ms. Ms. Parks, I know mm -hmm. you're relatively <coughs> new to teaching, right? right. We're mm -hmm. working on a project together, but you know, I see a lot and that's really what moved me. In your opinion, you know, what are you seeing that, um, in the schools? Um, I'm just seeing a complete breakdown, it seems, because it seems like students are just, they're not held accountable for anything. Um, parents are not involved. Administration is not involved. It seems that there's no structure, and I think that our students need structure, and it, we're really doing them a big disservice because we're not giving them what they need. The curriculum is not set up to help them. Um, I just think it's a it's a really sad situation because it's just not set up for their benefit. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I feel like urban children are an experiment. Um, and I say an experiment because we have these new programs that I've seen um, in different schools that come in. And they come in, they try it. If it doesn't work, they scrap it and they get a new program. And um, it's not proven to work. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering where is the, st the stability mm -hmm. um, for these kids, mm -hmm. something that will be proven to help them learn um, what they need to learn. Definitely. I just Part want to add something about yes. the programs, and that's one of the, the my pet peeves is that not only do they bring in the programs, but they only bring they do not bring the programs in 
in its full body. They mm -hmm. piecemeal it. They'll take parts of it and say, well, we'll use part of this program and leave out the other half of the program, meaning that you really don't see the success of a child and you really do not not know if that program truly worked because we did not use the full program. We use a part of the program right. here and a part of the program there. Um, also with accountability of, um, oh, let me go back, sorry, the technology. You know, we're in the technology um, stage and age now, and I've noticed that in our school, in this one school, I mean, technology is old. Um, they won't put the money in where you should have a person that runs a computer lab that has the license to be a computer right. uh, teacher or computer technologist to come in and fix the computers. Um, they have smart boards, but they only bring in three smart boards for 10 classrooms. Um, the children, they expect us to do assignments where we're supposed to have them on the computers and print out papers. Half of these kids still at home do not have computers. Don't let everybody think that every child at home has a computer. Right. Also, we're finding out they may have a computer, they don't have the printer, right. or they don't have the flash drive, or they don't have the paper, or they don't have the ink. And so therefore, when you're telling them, oh, just go home and go on the website and print a paper, this is going to be a problem. It's not going to, it's not going to work. And, and that right there, it drives me to my next question, because one of the uh, things okay. that I see that kills me in school is when I was in school, and I remember that I'm sure as we were, you were, we had textbooks. Mm -hmm. And not textbooks that we use in school, but textbooks that we took home. Because mm -hmm. the root of the word stu student mm -hmm. is S-T-U-D, stud, mm -hmm. I-E, study. So mm -hmm. how can you study mm -hmm. if you don't have books? N taking, people say, oh, you can take notes. Well, most people don't realize note taking is a skill. You yes. can't just learn, you mm -hmm. just, I just take yeah. notes. You yeah. can write a whole bunch of things down, mm -hmm. but what does it mean? You know, mm -hmm. are you writing down the most important things or the key mm -hmm. words, topics, things mm -hmm. of that nature? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the fact that the schools don't have the technology because they're out there, and I'm going to tell you mm -hmm. what's amazing about the smart boys. I'm assuming the smart boys are these white boys now that Correct. kind of project this. Yes, uh -huh. because exactly. Because I, I have my program out at Newark Central High School. They're in a new building, and every class has it. And it's amazing because the teacher can type at the yes. computer mm -hmm and everything is coming up on the board, so they don't mm -hmm. really need chalk in a chart, but almost right. every single classroom mm -hmm. has that. Mm -hmm. but, but I want to go back to the fact that, which is very important, because I think people do believe, like, oh, everybody has a computer at home. Mm -hmm. I think mainstream believes, like, everybody has a computer at home. Right. And I'm going to tell you, uh, we know right here in urban America, uh, everybody does not have That's a computer. Right. Or they um, have only part of it. Or computer. they have only part of it. Mm -hmm. Or their computer doesn't work. Yes. So if you tell a child to go home and go get on the computer, well, they don't have a computer at home. So the next argument, well, they can go to the library. Okay, well, someone has to take them. Yes. If the parent mm -hmm. works, nine times a ten in our communities, the parents are working and they don't mm -hmm. have that time, or they may not even be, unfortunately to say, committed to that degree. Yes. So now the child doesn't have the technology mm -hmm. in the school because it's not there, or it's mm -hmm. antiquated, or mm -hmm. the budget is just being utilized uh, frivolously and in the wrong way. Correct. Or, and then they don't have books. So how do our kids really compete? Mm -hmm. Because I dealt with a lot of kids, and I ask kids the question, I'm going to ask teachers, where do you see our kids in the next five years if we don't have textbooks that they can take home and study with, and they don't have the technology in the school, we just assume or presume that they have it at home. Where does that leave our kids, Ms. Edwards? I think it leaves our kids failing. But I mean, part of the thing, like, with access to technology, I know in our situation, there's a library on the route home. It takes, and you know, we give our kids time to type things in school. They could take five minutes to stop and print it out on the way home. True. I mean, like, I understand that people don't have these things at home sometimes, but there's always a way to work around that solution. Mm -hmm. And the biggest, my biggest frustration with my students is, they're just like, oh, well, I can't do it. They, they aren't willing to even attempt mm -hmm. to find another solution. Mm -hmm. And that's just, mm -hmm. it's disheartening. Mm -hmm. Because it's just like, you know, it's not always gonna be handed okay. to you. You mm -hmm. can't expect for everything to be there perfectly, mm -hmm. but it's not gonna work out if you're not willing to put forth the effort to try it either. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I think that also, I don't know, and it's really hard to say this, but and it's, it may sound kind of cold, but with the parents, yes. um, I know you have to work. Well, our parents, I know my parents worked, but um, there's a point where you have to draw the line. We, the teachers, did not birth the children. We didn't ask for these children. They came to us for us to educate. But it seems they want us to nurture them, feed them. I, at some point, sometimes, Close them. <laughs> I mean, we literally, if you think about some of our students, they arrive at school at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning to have breakfast mm -hmm. or play a game or basketball, baseball and have breakfast. 
They don't leave until five or six o'clock in the evening. Then they go home and then they have their dinner and then they're in the streets. Mm -hmm. I, you listen, some parents say, oh, they're not in the streets, they're locked up in the house. Well, where are they locked up in the house? Are they watching TV, playing games? And then I have another problem where is they don't come home, they talk about, I don't have a notebook. But meanwhile, I look at your shoes, and the shoes are one hundred and fifty dollars. Let's talk about uh, it. Um, I don't have a pencil, but I'm looking at your jacket, which is two hundred and fifty dollars. Yes. Or you got the newest gadget. There is. I have a problem of where do we draw the line, and what is important. And I really don't believe education truly is there at the top with these parents. I'm sure, yeah. Ms. Parks. Um, in terms of technology and textbooks and those things and where it leaves our kids, I think that it, it doesn't make them competitive for what's becoming like a more globalized mm -hmm. society. If our kids are going to be competing with children from around the world who have access to technology, then they themselves need to have you know, some skill and some experience with it. When they don't have the, the access to mm -hmm. it, um, you leave them failing. Like There's nothing they can do to even bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. And it makes them in a, it puts them in a position where um, they won't be able to make it. Right. Yeah, pretty much. It won't, it won't happen. Like, mm -hmm. no hope, prayer, or miracle mm -hmm. will get it there because it just won't happen mm -hmm. because they won't have the skills. Okay. I just noticed real quickly mm -hmm. that, to, I don't know when this is going to air, but um, they came out in the news today that uh, eighth grade, they're looking at eighth and twelfth grade, and they're stating that the children are not ready in eighth grade for um, if they're not at a certain level, they're not ready for college. They're using eighth grade as actually the standard of are they ready for college. Wow. And this came out in the news today. And they're saying that a lot of our students, they're questioning, are they really ready? And if I have to look at our students, and they're already questioning this in the United States and on the news, then so I'm concerned because knowing our eighth graders, mm -hmm. that means they're already behind. And if they're questioning it on a general aspect of it, then we're already 20 steps behind. Definitely. And, and that's so, it's so key and poignant that you say that because I, um, I have my young producers program and I'm a, you know, I work with uh, middle school students as well. And, I, and I've said that and I've been saying that for the past <clears> two <throat> years and I know I've just said that recently. And I, I say it jokingly because I say to some kids, listen, this is the best that you have to offer. And I'll go grab you a bag of oranges, some fruit, pick a highway. Because exactly. that's where you're going to be. And they laugh. You know what I'm saying? But the reality is they're not. And I tell them that. And they don't. And I didn't even read that. But mm -hmm. I look at some of the kids writing. Like my mm -hmm. program is Young Producers. And I bring it into the schools to give kids an outlet, something different. But at mm -hmm. the same time, it enhances and strengthens, the, strengthens their ability to write, mm -hmm. their ability to um, articulate themselves in that nature. Um, but I'm recognizing um, that they don't have that. I look at some of these kids writing, and I'm like, this is eighth grade? Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about, I know mm -hmm. I can remember writing better than this when I was in third grade. My son is in third grade. And I look at some of his writing, mm -hmm. and I compare it with middle school. And I'm going to be honest, I compare it with a couple of ninth grade students. Mm -hmm. And we are grossly, grossly behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to ask you, Ms. Which is, Carla, how long have you been teaching? This will be 10 years. 10 years. Because for me, you know, I've, I've been, you know, in educational mm -hmm. realms and arenas and doing mm -hmm. in different, in different capacities. But mm -hmm. if you can recall, when did, when did it change? Like, when did the moment come where kids, were, kids became in control? Like, how did that even come about? I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to say that twofold. As, as an ed ed educator and being in education for 10 years, I would say maybe the last five years, six years has gotten worse. However, as someone who was also in the field of health administration and working with young people before this, and this is what drives me to go into education, when the young, young mothers and crack mothers were having babies in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, I think that's where we started to see the trend of the babies not going to be able to handle life. Right. Meaning that they already have a disadvantage coming from a disadvantage of a mother of a 12, 13, 14 year old having children. And when you start looking at the, par the pattern of when these young people are having children and you start looking at the change of drugs and what type of drugs and what substance abuse was being used in the late 70s, early 80s, you can start seeing the trend. 
Mm -hmm. And I also thinking at the same time, we got that, like I said, the technology age, that changed. And when you have a TV not being turned off, I remember growing up that at 11.30, the TV went off with a buzz sound. It had the, the right. national anthem, right. and then it went off. Right. It was done. It was finished for the night. No it didn't open up until 6 o'clock in the morning. Right. So there was nothing else for you to do but to go to sleep or you read until you fell asleep. These kids are up. If you ask a child what's the average time they go to bed, a six-year-old will tell you 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at midnight, 1 in the morning. Wow. That's a problem. Yes. Um, also, everything is fast. If you, those games, they're wonderful for uh, what they call coordination. coordination right. However, when you think about it, you're speeding up the brain. And when you're speeding up the brain, they don't have patience to sit back and to think. You know, for people to invent, you got to have patience. You got to think. You got to be imaginative. You have to be sitting, sitting someplace where there's nothing in front of you to come up with ideas. The kids have to have some action going on. They have to see something. They can't sit still. They cannot be quiet and see if they can come up with something. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all those correlations, I think you can start seeing the change. But the last five, seven years, yes. It's out of control. Eh? It's getting out of control. The foul language, mm. the, the, the pants hanging below your self-esteem and who you are is no longer of uh, being proud of who you are and standing up and dressing correctly and speaking correctly. Now is you have to wear your pants below your knees, your shoes untied. You and and you had to speak a certain way. Yeah, you had to speak a certain way. And I think this is also playing a role. And when they walk into the classroom, you ask them for respect, they look at you, well, what do you mean respect? Now, that's what I want to get to next, um, because I see it. Now, the, the level of disrespect to me is just, is, is amazing. It's just amazingly horrible. I, when I yeah. say amazing, amazing can be good, amazing can be bad. In mm -hmm. this scenario, we're talking about amazingly poor. And as an administrator, you know, I, I, I wonder how is it that these kids can utilize this language? How can they have no respect, show disrespect, be just completely unruly? Um, and as an administrator, yeah. how is that not handled? Because now you know there's a problem, but it's always two sides. You know what I'm saying? If you're not a part of the mm -hmm. solution, you're part of the problem. Yeah. The kids, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. they're kids. Right, they right. have to be guided right. and directed. Right. But let's talk about the administration okay. of the board right. educational system. Right. Just the educational system. Because it seems like the administrators are not paying attention mm -hmm. to what's really mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they are mm -hmm. and they don't care. But mm -hmm. it depends on who your administrator mm -hmm. is. Okay. And, you know, as someone who has an administrative license and looking to go in that route at some point, that ro take that road, the one of the things you have to do is set the tone. Okay. And when you set the tone, I guarantee the kids will follow. And the one thing you have to do is that you, when the first day you meet your children, I mean the first day is you meet as a principal, whatever day that is, that's when you set your tone. You walk in, how you walk in, how you speak to the children, how you demand that when they walk in and they come in front of you, they don't have a hat on their head, their mm -hmm. pants is up, and that there's no foul language, and they cannot speak back to you. And they say, yes, sir. If you demand those kind of respect, they will give it back to you. Definitely. But when you never demand that respect from the beginning, it's very hard to come back and try to get it. Definitely. Ms. Mm -hmm. Parks. Um, I think that the tone has to be set by the administration. Um, the kids have the pa they feel they have the power because they know that they can curse you out, they know they can hit you, they know they can throw something at you, and nothing will happen to them. Yeah, now that I don't understand. They may have, they may be taken out of the class for one day, and then they'll be back in the classroom tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So they know there's nothing that you can really do. You're, you know, they can hit you, and you'll have to take it basically. At that's the end amazing. of the day, that's it. Now, when did that happen? Because I remember when I was in high school, definitely forget junior high, high school, so that's even later. You cannot touch a teacher. There was you know, strong consequences if you touched the teacher. You were suspended. Mm -hmm. You were suspended. Mm -hmm. you actually, you might just be expelled altogether. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. There were no such thing as safe mm -hmm. rooms. Because mm -hmm. is it called a safe room or a save? Save. 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 And save. what are they saving? Because, I mean, what goes on in a save room? Can somebody share with me? Because I don't know if my people at home are familiar with a save room. I still don't actually understand, and I've been working with schools. What it is a save on, room? It depends on what school you're in. In okay. some schools, the save room is actually a room where children go, mm -hmm. and they are taught, this is how you act, this is what respect is, mm -hmm. this is what's going to happen if you don't behave well, and the next step is you are out of the school. Right. In other schools, the save room is where they go to party and be, right. you know, just <laughs> relax and not have to learn anything because they're just stuck in this room with all the other exactly. disruptive children, and 
And then they end up begging really to go there. there. Yeah. Like, oh, send yeah. it to the save room. They yeah. end up acting out it's so like they a party. can go there. So, right. So now, what, what was seen, what was created to be a consequence, it's seemingly not. kids it's are looking at it like a luxury. Like, mm-hmm. I want to go to the save room. Definitely. I don't have to learn mm-hmm. anything, and I can just sit there and mm-hmm. chill out and talk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, let, I, what I want to talk about now, parental involvement. I remember I had a teacher um, said he had 200 students. And when open school night came, he saw three. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember open school. And I remember I got on punishment once because I forgot to I tell heard, my mom that about it was an after. Yes. That, why'd you have a half a day? Wait a minute, half a That's, day? Did you have open school after? And I'm yes. like, yeah, you're on punishment. <laughs> like, I forgot. No, you didn't. Yeah. So I want to talk about what do you think the breakdown? Why are parents not, if you can't come because you work, that's fine. But open school night is after open school night mm-hmm. and afternoon. So you can't tell me that this person who is supposed to be the most important aspect of your life, you can go find out what they're doing at their, mm-hmm. quote unquote, their job, if you will. What do you think is the breakdown with, with, with the uh, open school well, night? Well, part of it is just telling parents about open school night. I know sometimes parents don't get the notice till like two days before or a week before. And if you're working by the hourly wages <coughs> or you've got a night job, you need to know at least a month in advance so you can request the time off. Mm-hmm. A part of the other problem is, is like sometimes it is just timing. A lot of parents that I'm involved with, they work night shifts. I think open school night should have multiple chances. And also I said, part of it is just, you know, tell them in advance. They need to know this more than a week in advance. Not everybody can build a schedule around just a week's notice. And I think at the beginning of the year, when you have parents, when you're getting ready to start off your school, you should give them a calendar for the year. Yeah. There's certain things that are set in stone. and to not give that calendar. I know in some of the suburban places, the, the, the whole county gives them a calendar of what's going on in all the schools, from elementary through high school, for the whole year. Mm. Why can't we have a calendar for the kids? Right. These are some things that are set in stone. Right. A nice looking calendar, spend a little extra money, put some pride into this is our school, this is the calendar, parents mail it home, Give it home, you know, be sure each parent has it so that, you know, because I'm finding a lot of times, too, they say, well, we sent the notes home. The kids leave those flyers in their book bags. Right. They don't, a lot the of times, the they're, the door. Door, they're not going to tell. You can't rely on that child to give that information. Right. And um, pay your phone bill and have them, them calling the homes. Right. They have these phone systems, but you got to pay the phone bill to right. have that system. Right. You know, so it's just some little basic things that you need to have in place as a structure. And I think that is not there for that. All right, mm-hmm. so let's let's say we got a few more moments. So we know there's a lot of the problems, you know, but let's, if you can, each point give me, what do you think, you know, one or two solutions you think that's at least, if not a complete solution, <clears throat> it's definitely a, a strong starting point where we need to start turning this thing around. What's some two things you think we could do, Ms. Parks? I think the first one is that parents have to be involved. They have to take an interest in their child's life. Um, I understand they're middle school age at this point, but they're not grown. They don't have the answers. So you need to be there guiding them, pushing them, making sure they succeed. This is like your greatest jewel that you have on the earth. And I feel like it's your job to make sure that it comes out okay. Um, So parent involvement has to go up. I also think that there has to be consequences um, for these children. They have to learn that there are consequences for your actions, because if they don't learn it now, they will learn it when they're grown. Definitely. Yes. Um, one of the things that I think is that as an administrator, you need to be involved in your community. You need to go to the board meetings. You need to know who your congressman is, of where you work. You need to know who is uh, who all the people that are the players of your community. The more people you, you know and are involved in that community of where your students are, the possibility of reaching out when you need them, they will be there for you. And I think that is mainly one of the crucial. And two, set the tone to your school. If you set your tone, I guarantee you, you, are, you can have a not too bad. I mean, nothing's guaranteed, right, right. but it will not be as bad as it could be if you set that tone. Okay. Okay. My colleagues already said student accountability and parent involvement. Another thing that I also think has to change is that we need to start teaching not just to the test. I honestly yes. believe we need mm-hmm. to bring back the arts yep. in the schools. Yes. We need yep. to have the options music. for kids. Not Absolutely. everybody mm-hmm. wants to spend all of their life being academic, 
academic year. Mm -hmm. yes. And that is perfectly understandable. I think that for some kids who, you know, after a certain point, if it's clear that the academics just isn't what they want to do, at least make sure they have a way so they can learn a skill yes. so they can get a job. I mean, I remember I had the option of going to school where I could learn how to be an auto mechanic. I could learn how to do all these hands-on things, which I thought was awesome. Right. I just decided, okay, that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Right. So I think we need to have those options mm -hmm. for children mm -hmm. again. Again, yes. Because okay. it's Definitely. just something they need. And also, student accountability. I, children, they should have to understand, you know what? You're, you're in your teen years. You're on your way to becoming an adult. It's become your responsibility to make sure you have your notebook, your responsibility mm -hmm. to make sure you have your pencil, your responsibility to make sure you get here by 8 o'clock when the bell rings. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's no reason you should be walking in at 9 a.m. talking about, oh, my mom didn't wake me. Right, right. Definitely. exactly. I'm sorry. Definitely. Now, <laughs> and, and, and what you said is so key, the fact that they don't have arts. They've removed a lot yes. of these programs. Yeah. Of course, mm -hmm. they got rid of vocational schools and yeah. trades mm -hmm. is not there, because that's where we would you know, be able to capitalize mm -hmm. and be able to sustain and, exactly. and provide a living or, yes. or for or a lifestyle for our families once mm -hmm. upon a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that, but thus is the reason I created the Young Producers mm -hmm. program. Now, unfortunately, you two ladies can't really uh, give an, a, a feedback on it because I mm -hmm. haven't had the pleasure of working with your classes, but Ms. Parks, I am working with your classes, and mm -hmm. I want you to tell me what do you think about the Young Producers program? Okay, so the Young Producers program has been phenomenal, transformational, and I am so excited uh, with the desire for change that it's put inside of my students. Great, great. Understand something. It's very important that you take care of your children. You had them, you love them, they're yours. Um, without you, they will not succeed. The Young Producers Program does some amazing things, but only because of the teachers that are involved and the kids' desire to express their creativity. I want you to recognize that the teachers cannot do it alone. They need your help. Um, they need your support. So recognize your position, recognize your rules, step your game up, be a parent to your child and a father to your child. As always, you've been watching the Urban Wall Street Project. I want you to be mindful, be prosperous, take care of your children, take care of your communities. Until next time, Peace.